the Nevada Historical Society has been collecting, safeguarding, and interpreting the artifacts that bear witness to our state's colorful history. The Society is now housed in permanent headquarters, but the road getting here was not a smooth one. I'm Gwen Clancy for the Nevada Department of Cultural Affairs, and our guest host today is Peter Benderaga, who will tell us the story of the Nevada Historical Society. Welcome to the Nevada Historical Society. It is going to be my very pleasant task to guide you on a tour through our first hundred years. 2004 is our centennial year, and we've prepared a very special exhibition to share with you some of our unique experiences and some of the wonderful pieces of Nevada's heritage that we've collected over the last century. It began on May 31, 1904, during a meeting of the Social Sciences Subcommittee of the Nevada Academy of Sciences on the campus of the University of Nevada. The professor of history at the university, Jean Elizabeth Weir, argued forcefully that the Silver State desperately needed an historical society to preserve the memories of Nevada's pioneer generation before they passed from the scene. The state was already 40 years old, and it was apparent that the old-timers were departing much too quickly. Possibly because it was her idea, and because her colleagues were swayed by her characteristic persuasiveness and persistence, Professor Weir was asked to lead the new organization. She agreed. She went on to serve as the Society's director without pay for nearly half a century, filling it to overflowing with important records and relics that tell our state's story. From the beginning, the collections have formed the core of the Nevada Historical Society. At first, the membership rate was $1 per year. Yet even with 400 initial members statewide, the Society could not survive on such a small budget. In 1907, after listening to Professor Weir and her many supporters, the legislature created the Nevada Historical Society as an agency of state government. Ironically, the Society was not included in the governor's budget until 1909. In 1908, Jean Weir made her first field trip to southern Nevada. In those early days and at the height of the summer, she traveled by train, horse, wagon, automobile, and on foot. She brought back many important collections from the mines and ranches of Pioch and Panaca and the brand new town of Las Vegas. The following summer, she traveled to the booming mining camp of Bullfrog near Beatty to retrieve the library, papers, photographs, and furnishings from the office of U.S. Senator William Stewart, the father of the Nevada Constitution and the federal mining laws. She took everything she could lay hands on, including the sign from the front of the building and his letterpress, and shipped it all back to Reno. The woman responsible for saving much of Nevada's heritage was truly remarkable. Born on April 8, 1870 in Grinnell, Iowa, Jenny Weir, as she was known in those days, attended the public schools and graduated from the Iowa State Teachers College, now Grinnell College, in 1893. Like many of her classmates, young Jenny had been imbued at home, church, and school with the vigorous tenets of the evangelical Protestantism that held sway throughout most of America. At college, she was elected president of the Young Women's Christian Association and the Shakespeare Society. The normal ITE for December 13, 1892, that's the student newspaper, reported Weir's remarks at a Greek symposium presented by the Shakespeare group. She spoke of the high degree of culture attained by the ancient Greeks and compared the condition of the Grecian women with the women of today. Her delivery was marked by ease and dignity of manner, and her production showed much thought and beauty of expression. On completing the three-year Bachelor of Didactics degree, Weir headed west to continue her career. After teaching and serving as a vice principal in Hepner, Oregon, she enrolled in the then new Leland Stanford Junior University in Palo Alto, California, where she concentrated on the study of Native American culture in the West. At Stanford, she joined fellow Iowan Herbert Hoover, and pursued a Bachelor of Arts degree in history with Professor Max Ferrand. Ferrand was the close academic friend of Professor Frederick Jackson Turner of the University of Wisconsin. Only two years before, at the Columbian Exposition of 1893, Turner had shocked the historical community by declaring, based on a study of the 1890 census, that the frontier, that avenue to freedom, that singular element of American life that had done so much to shape the distinctive American character, was now closed. America must henceforth develop in a new way. It was important for the course of American historiography over the next several generations that Turner came from Wisconsin. One of the first acts of the brand new state legislature in 1846 was to create the State Historical Society of Wisconsin, 
Its purpose was to collect the memories and heritage of the pioneers of the new state before they passed off the scene. The good people of Wisconsin were quite aware that mainstream academia, with its attention focused squarely on the eastern seaboard, would never pay them any heed. If their history were to be preserved and written, they would have to do it themselves. At Stanford, Weir flourished under the guidance of Professor Ferrand and others. In 1899, President Joseph Stubbs of the University of Nevada wrote to colleagues at Palo Alto seeking a replacement for Professor Ann Martin, who was leaving Reno to pursue graduate studies in New York. Weir was recommended and came to Reno as a substitute in the fall. When Martin did not return the next year, having gone to London, where she became a suffragette, Weir was hired permanently. As she adjusted to the near-frontier conditions of turn-of-the-century Reno, Weir soon came to love her adopted state. She continued her bachelor's studies long distance with Ferran and chose as the topic for her 1901 senior thesis an ethnographic study of the Washoe Indians, which is still the seminal work in the field. In an address given to the Academy of Sciences in 1905, she recalled her early days in Reno. And first of all, let me assure you that I speak as a Nevadan. Shortly after coming to the state, when Stanford University vanquished Nevada in a game of football, it was impossible for me to conceal my pleasure at the result. There were many who chided me for my sympathy with my own college team, but I shall never forget how the president of the university, Joseph Stubbs, mildly remarked that he would allow me two years in which to change my views, that he did not believe in sudden conversions anyhow. In addition to teaching all of the history and political sciences courses at the university, Weir threw herself into the task of creating and fostering the new Nevada Historical Society. In that same address of 1905, she specified why the work of the new Nevada Historical Society was so important. It is for us as a society to see that the landmarks of our history are not obscured, neither are the portraits of our heroes and our pioneers lost to present view. Certain it is that the day cannot be far distant when no human memory will be able to furnish the details of the events which have made us what we are today. Already there is a lamentable lack of interest among the younger generation. It will indeed be a sad day for Nevada when a people have grown up who do not know Joseph or the way by which we came into this land. Until 1913, Weir kept and displayed the growing Nevada Historical Society collections in her home on 9th Street, now University Terrace. After an appropriation from the 1911 session of the legislature for a building was vetoed by acting Governor Denver Dickerson, Weir and her supporters lobbied hard in the next session and secured an appropriation of $5,000 for the purchase of land and construction of a scaled-down temporary facility to house the collections and provide space for exhibitions, library, reference, and publications. You're watching Exploring Nevada, and today we're celebrating the centennial of the Nevada Historical Society. Coming up next, Professor Weir's persistence pays off.